Welcome to Centfold Road Online. We're meeting live now, a number of our districts at a time in here on Sunday mornings, but we're also carrying on online as well for the time being for all of us at home. So it's great to have you with us as we join in worship this morning. As we carry on our series looking at the big story of the Bible, we're thinking today about God's promises. God's promises made to this beautiful but broken creation. Promises are words that we hear that create a, a sort of sense of expectation in us and hope for something good to happen. Sometimes though, we have to wait a good while to see them truly fulfilled and wonder if they will ever be. And in one of his letters to the church in Corinth, Paul recognises the nature of broken human promises. We say, yes, yes, I'll do that. But in the same breath, no, no, I didn't. We all know about broken promises from having heard them and having made them. But God is faithful in his promising, says Paul. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the Amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. So we praise Jesus Christ, who seals and delivers everything that God, maker of heaven and earth, has promised to do to restore this broken world and our broken lives. And we live with God's spirit in us, refreshing that truth of God's promises in us. However long we must wait and whatever we may go through. And we say, Amen. Let it be so. In faith and hope to the glory of God. i 
The Presbyterian Church in Ireland produces a weekly resource on its website and by email called Let's Pray. Often it opens with uh, written prayers, which are so helpful. Let me lead us in prayer now, using words based on one of those prayers. Let's pray. Lord of all time, who has spoken into history as the God of promise, we come to worship you and to renew our trust in you. Lord, what we thought might be a short pause now seems like an eternity. What we began describing as extraordinary times are beginning to feel pretty ordinary. What we first experienced as an interruption to our lives has merged into an unwanted new normal. We need you to stay our hearts, to give staying power for the long haul, but also help us stay put for the moment with patience and restraint. Help us to learn the lesson that our times are in your hands, and as we wait upon the Lord, our strength will be renewed. Help us to live in this in-between time, like our father Abraham, anticipating your blessing before the birth of God's promised son. Like Joseph, captive as a prisoner in Egypt, before his dreams came true. Like Moses, tending his father-in-law's flock in the desert, before encountering you in the burning bush. Like the Israelites, wandering for 40 years in the wilderness, before entering the promised land. Like David on the run from Saul before his anointing led to his ascending the throne. Like Jesus, tried and tempted for 40 days and nights before emerging to his life's great purpose. Our hearts cry, how long, O Lord? A new reply. Know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And so we continue to wait on you. Refresh us by your spirit in the truth of your promises, which are yes in Christ. Give strength and courage for these long days. And in Jesus' name we say, Amen. Now, do keep up with our announcements and you can download the announcement sheet from our website and print it off if you like. And it gives info about our midweek prayer activities, our life groups, about the Christmas Child Shoebox Appeal, which we're encouraging people to do online this year, and about Tuesday break, which is at 2.30 on Wednesday the 7th of October. And do let Jean McClune know uh, if you are going. E20M is continuing on with Hillary this week. It's a great way of following the big Bible story too, with different people each week reading from this wonderful Jesus storybook Bible. But now as a reminder of our great big God, who makes great promises for us from the very beginning, and as a reminder of all those weeks ago, Early on in lockdown, here's a song to enjoy.
So far in the story of the kingdom, a big picture overview of the Bible story, we've seen the pattern of the kingdom beautifully set up as God's people in God's place under God's blessing and rule. But also the perished kingdom where God's people reject God's rule and end up banished from his place and under the curse of sin and judgment. That took us through to Genesis chapter 11. Still the early chapters of the first book of the Bible, but so much that helps us to understand the greatness of God and his purposes and the beauty and brokenness of the world as it is today. We saw in these chapters many points at which God might well have given up on the whole creation and kingdom project. But time and again, there are these notes of hope of grace, of his lasting promise and intention from the beginning to bring about his people in his place under his blessing and rule. And even when things reach their low point at the Tower of Babel at the start of Genesis 11, that picture of universal sin and the godlessness and brokenness of humans and societies across the earth, even then that is not the end. There comes another resounding note of hope. Eleven chapters of a wide-angled view of the world now start to zoom in. What follows this universal picture of the Tower of Babel is another genealogy, another list of names of descendants, a continuing search for the promised one, the offspring of Eve mentioned in Genesis 3.15, who would come to crush Satan and evil for good. And so the wide angle lens narrows its focus through this line and in Genesis 12 pinpoints one particular human being. Now he probably wasn't an American dude in a white t-shirt and sunglasses. And he certainly wasn't the promised one himself. But here is a key turning point in the big Bible story. Because God's ongoing plan to bring about his kingdom, even in this cursed world, and to do it through his promised one to come, well, that would all come about through this man. Good morning, church. This morning's reading is from Genesis 12, verses 1 to 9. The call of Abram. The Lord has said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarah, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram travelled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Moreh at Shechem. At the time the Canaanites were in the land, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give you this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he went towards the hills east of Bethel, and pissed his tent. 
with Bethel on the west and I on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Then Abba set out and continued towards Negev. Amen. first appears following the story of the Tower of Babel and he's the effective endpoint of this family tree in Genesis 11 that begins with Noah's son Shem and Abraham comes from my favorite Bible quiz answer where was Abraham from uh, that's correct now he's not an Israelite or a Jew there was no such idea then. He's plucked from seeming obscurity, having set out with his father from Ur in Chaldea, Babylon or modern day Iraq. And he's headed to Canaan, what would become Israel. But they've settled on the way in Haran, in modern day Syria. Abraham is an unlikely candidate to bring about future generations. He's 75, and he and his wife, Sarah, have been unable to have children and extend this family line any further. But the Lord says to him, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land which I will show you. Now, this isn't just the story of a person being called by God to live life for him and in a different country. Sometimes people might read this 
and think, oh, maybe God is calling me to leave everything behind and serve him as a missionary somewhere else. Well, he might be. But this story is fundamentally much bigger than that. It's the huge story of God's promised kingdom. See, God calls Abraham to leave behind his place, his people, and the blessing and rule of his father's household. But what does he promise to and through Abraham in these following verses? Well, one, people. Through Abraham, he will bring about a great people, a great nation, it says here in verse two. Incredible, seeing as Abraham is childless. But this man, whose name already means exalted father, will have that name changed by God at the sealing of this promise to Abraham, father of many. He will be the father of many peoples, as numerous as the sand on the shore or the stars in the sky, says God later. As well as people, God promises place. Go to the land I will show you, says God in verse 1. And when Abraham gets to Canaan with his family and all this stuff in verses 4 to 7, the Lord says, to your offspring, I will give this land. The Lord is promising a place for all these people. And thirdly, blessing. I will bless you. You will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Look at all those words of blessing in verses 2 and 3. The repeated idea through these promises is of God's blessing to Abraham and through him. In the face of the cursed world of Genesis 11, God promises blessing. And also we should note that God does say, whoever curses you, I will curse, in verse 3. Whoever dismisses what God is promising and what God is doing through Abraham here, whoever refuses to find themselves a part of it, remains with God's curse. But in a cursed world, there is blessing promised through Abraham and his offspring for people throughout the nations. And so Abraham worships and calls on the name of the Lord in verses 7 and 8. He recognises the rule of the king of creation who will bring about his kingdom. These verses are God's mission plan. In a beautifully patterned but perishingly cursed world, God promises through Abraham to bring about his kingdom people, place and blessing throughout the earth. Following the introduction of Genesis 1 to 11, these verses set the agenda for the rest of the Bible story. They set out God's plan of the kingdom. The rest of this story is, in one sense, simply God's execution of what he's promised and will do. We read the rest of this book, looking forward to God bringing about his people in his place under his blessing and rule. Now, of course, there's still a roller coaster ride to follow through all of that. And so much in here that teaches us in such beauty, variety and power about the king and his kingdom and our place in it. And we should also take a moment to understand these promises rightly from the beginning. First off, and from the start, we should be clear that Jesus Christ is the offspring of Abraham through whom all these promises will come true. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 16, Paul helps us understand that the word for offspring in Hebrew and in Greek, as well as in English, can mean 
many or one? And there clearly is a sense in Genesis in which it means many. From Abraham will come all the Israelites, as well as many other peoples, and they will play their key part in the big Bible story, as we'll see in the coming weeks. That and they are neither to be overlooked nor dismissed, as Paul recognises more fully in Romans. But Paul is also clear that God's plan through these promises was always going to be fulfilled in one particular offspring or descendant of Abraham. And he explicitly names that person as Jesus Christ. Sorry if I've spoiled the story for you from so early on. But the point is, however we see this partially worked out in the story of the Israelites through the Old Testament, for our real benefit and learning too. Yet from the beginning, God's promises were going to be and are fulfilled only and ultimately in Jesus. It was always and is always all about Jesus. And we'll see this fulfillment as the story progresses later. Secondly, we should be clear that from the beginning, with respect to being God's people and part of his kingdom, it has always been a matter of faith, not of background or of performance. Committed trust in God is what has truly mattered from the beginning, not who or where you come from or how well you've done in keeping God's laws. Again, the Old Testament story of Abraham's physical descendants, who became the Jews living in what became Israel and following God's laws, that all teaches us much about being the people of God. And that plays its part in salvation history. But from the beginning, it's not been about where you come from. Abraham was plucked from obscurity and the blessing was given for peoples from the nations, not just a particular land. And it hasn't been about your bloodline or how well you kept God's laws. It's been a matter of faith. Paul reminds us that Abraham found his part in God's kingdom by receiving the promises and committing his trust, believing in the one who promised. And people from all nations and all bloodlines, all backgrounds, you and me, for example, we become true children of Abraham, that phrase that the Bible uses for God's people of the kingdom. We become true children of Abraham by doing the same as Abraham, putting our committed trust in the one who promised and who fulfills these promises, Jesus Christ. And thirdly, it's important to understand that God's promised place is ultimately not a particular country, but the new creation that he is preparing. A lot of the action in the Old and New Testaments takes place in and around this land God talks to Abraham about, Canaan which becomes Israel. And we still sometimes talk about it as the promised land or the holy land. And it still plays a significant part in world affairs. But as we look at these promises and how Abraham took them, God's vision of his kingdom place is much, much bigger than any piece of land in the Middle East or anywhere else for that matter. The writer to the Hebrews says, By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he didn't know where he was going. 
By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Abraham and his family lived in tents in the promised land. They didn't make this their home as though they had fully arrived in what God had promised. Instead, goes on the writer to the Hebrews, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. What Abraham and his family looked forward to was not simply the land of Israel, but a city designed, prepared and built by God, a heavenly city. The city pictured at the end of Revelation, bringing the new heavens and the new earth together. God's kingdom place to live with his people forever. The promise of God's place is only ultimately fulfilled in the new creation. There, as God has promised here to Abraham, God's people from across the nations will enjoy God's blessing and rule all in and through Abraham's singular and true offspring, the King, Jesus Christ. But having understood these promises rightly from the beginning, let me end with a couple of takeaways from these kingdom promises that God makes to Abraham. Well, the, the first takeaway for us this morning is to appreciate just how amazing it is that the Lord delivers himself to fulfill these promises. There are a couple of incidents in Abraham's life that demonstrate something powerful about God's commitment to deliver on these promises for us, his people. The first is in a ceremony that takes place to seal the covenant, this binding promise between God and Abraham. In Genesis 15, we read about when Abraham is a little bit concerned, being without a child, as to how all of this is going to work out and how he can know that the people and the place are coming his way. Well, in that chapter, God tells him to set up a covenant ceremony, which will be a known practice at the time. What would happen is that animals were taken and several of them cut in half and put opposite each other to create a pathway down the middle. The idea was that when two people made a deal, they would both walk through the halved animals together. And in effect, they would be saying to each other, if I break this deal, if I break this covenant, these promises I'm making, may it be done to me as it has been to these animals. If a deal was made in such a way, it was a deal made in blood and with the consequence of death, if broken. But at this ceremony in Genesis 15, God puts Abraham to sleep on one side. And in a vision, as he reiterates the promises to him, Abraham sees this, that the Lord himself, symbolized in a fiery torch, walks through the slaughtered animals. Not Abraham, who's at the side, just the Lord walking through. In doing so, God took the keeping of these promises entirely on himself. And in effect, he said of his covenant, let this be done to me. I will take on the bloody deathly consequences so that even if this covenant is broken on the human side, the promises will remain intact. 
And then later on, when by God's miraculous grace, Sarah and Abraham have a son, Isaac. We read in chapter 22 of Genesis how God puts Abraham to the test and asks him to sacrifice his one and only son. Now this sounds harsh, brutal, uncaring maybe. And as you picture them making their way there, Abraham and young Isaac, Isaac carrying the wood for the burnt offering and asking where the lamb was, you can only imagine Abraham's voice and his feelings as he answers, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. But before we concentrate too much on the request God made in what was actually a very unique situation to the father of many nations to whom such history-changing promises were made, we should also recall what resulted, what actually happened. The Lord did not allow Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, his one and only son, nor had he seemingly actually intended for that to happen. Instead, with Abraham's faith made clear, God demonstrated what would ultimately happen. The Lord provided a sacrifice, and Abraham called that place the Lord will provide. For to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. Not Abraham's one and only son, but God's. The Lord swears by himself here that he will provide and deliver to fulfil the promises he has made for us. He himself will do all it takes in this cursed world to bring about his kingdom of blessing. And the second and final takeaway for us today is this, that Abraham was blessed to be a blessing. I will bless you, says God, and you will be a blessing. And as those who through Jesus are what the Bible calls Abraham's children, children of the promise, we follow our father in this regard. We are blessed to be a blessing. We are plucked from obscurity, plucked from unlikelihood, plucked from nowhere and nothing to do with us, people carrying the curse of sin, yet to receive the blessing of God now and forever in Jesus, a place in his everlasting kingdom. But that is a blessing, not to stop at our street like a cul-de-sac, but to flow through us like an avenue. We are called to be a blessing to others, to all the peoples of the earth, near and far. That is the calling of Abraham and of the people of God. That's a mission statement for us, if you like. Be blessed and be a blessing. From our family, neighbours, work colleagues, to the people of Japan, Kenya, India and wherever else. Know and receive God's grace, his truth and love in Christ Jesus and share it with the world around. May God bless us as we seek to be a blessing to his world in Jesus Christ. Amen. Speak, O Lord, and renew our minds. Help us grasp the light of your plans for us. Truths unchanged from the dawn of time that will echo down.
Let us all join together in prayer. Let us pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, thank you that you are God, all-powerful, all-knowing, creator God. Thank you that when you created the world, it was good. Lord, forgive us for messing up our stewardship of your beautiful world. Forgive us for the sins we have committed this week. Thank you that through Jesus' blood we can have that forgiveness and thank you for restoring us into a relationship with you. What a tremendous privilege and blessing it is to be in relationship with you. Lord, we pray that as we study this overview of your big story, we would grow in that relationship with you and experience the tremendous blessings you have for us. Help us to be like Abram and trust you no matter what. Help us to be totally obedient to your leading. We thank you that there are many in our congregation who have heard your voice and who have obediently followed. We pray for John and Barita and little Jonas. We ask that you would give energy and stamina to them and bless them with deeper friendships. We pray for Gerald and Louise and give you thanks for their new blessing of little James. We thank you that life is less chaotic for them than anticipated and we pray for Daniel and Jeremiah too as they adapt to their little brother. We pray for Heather as she considers her future in India in the light of COVID. We thank you for Ben, Johnny, Jill and the interns who have listened to your voice and followed obediently. Thank you for their vision and leadership in our congregation. We thank you too for Dave and his leadership in Alpha Online. It's exciting to hear that there are around 25 people involved and pray that many would hear your voice and respond to it. Lord, we pray for a mighty movement of your spirit, that many would experience you in a new and real way. Open their lives to experience your blessing. We pray especially for the start of Kids Friday Connect that happened on Friday. We pray that this will be an opportunity for children to connect with each other again, but also with you. We thank you for the leaders in our congregation, willing and able to give up their time to invest in these young lives. Pour your blessing into each one involved. And Lord, we also thank you that Tuesday break is preparing to restart too. We pray that older folks would be encouraged to come. Father, take away any anxiety or nervousness they may feel about gathering together in person. And may this chance to reconnect and have fellowship face to face be a real blessing to them. Lord, we thank you for the team in our congregation who have worked so hard to get us to this point of being able to tentatively meet face to face. But Father, as we look around at society, the situation regarding COVID-19 seems to be deteriorating once again. Lord, we do pray against a second surge. Will you protect us as a church family from this virus? Keep us all safe, Lord. Help us to be wise and responsible in our actions. Lord, we don't know why this is happening, but help us to continue to trust you. You are on the throne and in total control. We pray especially for those known to us and those not known to us, who have been and continue to be badly affected by this virus. We pray for those who have lost their jobs, those who are uncertain about the future, who are struggling financially. 
Those who are lonely and miss the contact of loved ones. Those who are grieving the loss of a loved one. Father, will you meet them at their point of need? Be their rock, their guide, their comfort at this time. All these things we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all forevermore. Amen.